Welcome to Family Bible Time. We are in Jeremiah 47. And we're also in Psalm 23 and Psalm 24. Two more shepherd psalms as they're considered. Um, and we'll get into those shortly. But first, the Philistines. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, thank you for your word, thank you for truth, thank you that we can come to your Bible and rely upon it. Uh, we pray that you would give us wisdom and grace and help us to understand it. Help us even just as we gain familiarity with the people groups in your word. Uh, we pray that you'd help us to gain that understanding which will help us to get the meaning from the different passages that we read. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet concerning the Philistines. The Philistines. Who were the Philistines? Today, maybe you'll hear somebody insult somebody else by telling them that they're a complete Philistine. Mm -hmm. And that just comes from the Bible because the Philistines were the pagan enemies of Israel, weren't they? The foes of Israel. Where did they live? Philistia. Philistia, very good, yes. But where did they live in respect to Israel? So if Israel is that strip and on the... I just have to always stop it so that I can flip it the other way around. So... On the eastern border of Israel, you've got, well, the, the River Jordan, and then beyond that, there's kind of Moab and Ammon and places like that. We'll come to them later. But then on the western border of Israel is the Mediterranean Sea, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When you go up to the top, there's those two cities, Tyre and Sidon. When you come down to the bottom, in the kind of southwest corner of Israel, there's a bit which was Philistia for the longest time. Wow. Obviously, when the Israelites invaded the land of Canaan, it was just all Canaan, Canaanites. And they, they, they dealt with the Canaanites up to a point, but not all of them. But then... It seems as though some of the Canaanites in that southwestern corner were invaded, pushed out by, displaced by this people group called, who became the Philistines. Who were they? Where did they come from? Well, it seems that they probably came from the Sea Peoples, maybe, and this is not certain, it's disputed in academia, but maybe they came from... Um, Cyprus and the the Greek islands in the Aegean and they were basically ancient Greeks before the Greeks became a nation and so they maybe had some relationship to those uh, seagoing peoples. There are inscriptions in Egypt about battles and there's stories about battles between the Egyptians and these sea peoples. Maybe it's them. Maybe that the history is confused. But they became the Philistines and they became the enemies of Israel. It was from the Philistines that you had the giant Goliath mm -hmm. and then another giant Goliath. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems as though they had these um, genes mixed in that um, made them some pretty impressive peoples at times. Um, but they had a, 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 a population of their own people. They had a civilization of their own. They had their gods. They had their five cities. The five cities of the Philistines. Do you remember that? I remember the, the, the five lords of the Philistines. What were they called? Can you remember the five cities of the Philistines? Ashdod. Ashdod, Ekron, Gaza, yeah. Gath, and another one. <laughs> anyway. Megiddo? No. No, not Megiddo. Did you say Ekron? Ekron, yeah. Um, 
Anyway, those they, they had their five lords. They had their five main cities. And they were the people who just were the long-time enemies of Israel, you would say. They were subdued in David's day. Um, but, but before that, in the time of Saul and Samuel, they were ruling over Israel. Do you remember? Mm. They were preventing the Israelites from making swords and everyone had to go and sharpen his sickle or his plow to the, to the Philistines. Are yeah, you having a, a ring disaster? Um, okay. So, um, the Philistines. All right. We're going to do this a little bit with each of these people groups, I hope, and just recover some familiarity. But um, these were the words that, of the Lord that came from, to Jeremiah the prophet concerning the Philistines. So it's about the Philistines. And then here's the timing of the prophecy before Pharaoh struck down Gaza. Now, when did Pharaoh, king of Egypt, strike down Gaza? Oh, that's hard to pin down because the Egyptians invaded at different times and the knowledge of that is lost. Possibly, this would have been in Jeremiah's time, this would have been about 609 BC, because in 609 BC, Pharaoh did come up and went up through Philistia. Possibly then he struck down Gaza and ended up in Megiddo, and in Megiddo, that's where Josiah met him in battle and died. Um, so that was before the Battle of Carchemish in 605 BC. But in 609 BC, that was the Battle of Megiddo. Right. Anyway, so that just times the prophecy. And that's actually got the timing of the prophecy has got nothing to do with the content of the prophecy because the content of the prophecy is all about the Babylonians. Let's get into it. And the Philist Philistines. Thus says the Lord, verse 2, Behold, waters are rising out of the north, that's the Babylonians, and shall become an overflowing torrent. They shall overflow the land and all that fills it, the city and those who dwell in it. Men shall cry out, and every inhabitation of the land shall wail at the noise of the stamping of the hoofs of his stallions, at the rushing of his chariots, at the rumbling of their wheels. The fathers look not back to their children, so feeble are their hands, because of the day that is coming to destroy all the Philistines, to cut off from Tyre and Sidon. Hang on, Tyre and Sidon are up in the north, aren't they? This is just describing... The, uh, uh, the fact that, that there must have been an alliance between the Philistines and the uh, people of Tyre and Sidon, who were the Phoenicians up in the northwest. So to cut off from Tyre and Sidon every help that remains. So what's, what's it saying is, oh, okay, the Philistines are going to be attacked and destroyed by the Babylonians. And that's going to cut off from Tyre and Sidon the people who would have helped them. For the Lord is coming, for, for the Lord is destroying the feminine, the feminines. <laughs> the, the Lord is just <laughs> destroying the Philistines, the remnant of the coastland of Kaftor. Are you laughing at me as well with my family? <laughs> Laugh on, I don't care. Um, the, the, the remnant of the coastland of Kaftor. Oh yes, the Philistines were, according to the Bible, the descendants uh, of Kaftor, the Kaftorim. And again, uh, that's not uh, clear in the tracing of the ancestry why well names were repeated weren't they but mm -hmm. if it's the right if it's the same people group then these are some of the descendants of ham anyway 
Boldness has come upon Gaza. Ashkelon has perished. Oh, boldness is a sign of mourning, isn't it? So they're, um, they're, they're, they're grieving. Ashkelon has perished. Oh, remnant of their valley, how long will you gash yourselves? That was another thing they did when they were grieving and mourning. Do you remember all those people the other day who turned up at Jerusalem mm. having gashed themselves and shaved their beards? Mm. That would have been considered boldness. Ah, um, oh, sword of the Lord, how long till you are quiet? Put yourself into your scabbard, rest and be still. How can it be quiet when the Lord has given it a charge against Ashkelon and against the seashore? He has appointed it. Oh, can you, I mean, I don't know if you can take this in, but the, the, the people of Philistia, the Philistine peoples, They'd had a long history, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and they'd been, okay, they'd been dominated by David and Solomon, but they'd re come back to their own sort of semi-independence after that in the divided kingdom. They regained a bit of power and independence uh, from Israel, and they'd been conquered a, different points by the, the Egyptians, but they'd still retained their own kind of political identity and the kings were allowed to stay in place. But this now is, is going to be totally disastrous for them. The, the Babylonians are going to come and, and really um, destroy the the the, you would say the political identity, the identity as a nation of the Philistines. Babylonians um, were going to devastate them. Isn't it good of God to warn them? I mean, these are the enemies of Israel. And, 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 it, and in this passage we just read, it's like, oh, you know, how long will the sword of the Lord do this? And, and, and you're saying, this is... This is kind of God saying, I don't want to have to judge you, but I'm going to judge you. Mm. I'm, I'm going to deal with this, this nation. And, and yet you wonder, don't you, whether there were people among the Philistines, uh, but like Rahab, who'd heard, who, who, who feared the Lord, who, who really were actually, when... They heard the words of this prophecy that would have come their way, one way or another, whether Jeremiah had to go there and deliver it, like, uh, like Jonah, or whether it, this was just sent to them. I don't know, but either way, they would have heard this prophecy. And imagine that. Imagine being in Philistia and, and the talk are going around. Oh, there's this weird prophet. Jeremiah, who came from Israel. I mean, brave guy to come over here. <laughs> and he came here and told us that their God is going to send people from the north to destroy us all. And, and it was all kind of, it was weird because it was the God of the Hebrews. The prophecy was all about the God of the Hebrews kind of mourning over the death of people in Philistia. I mean, don't you think that would have impacted... Mm. Some of them would be like, oh, well, maybe I believe that and I, I need to seek the Lord while he may be found. Maybe some of them were saved as a result mm -hmm. of this warning. I think it's also really important for us today, this prophecy and these subsequent prophecies, to remember that God deals with nations. Right? I really have had this on my mind as a question for how many years? Oh, decades now, isn't it? I mean, remember me going to the Banner of Truth conference? and um, I remember many years ago, I asked this question at the Banner of Truth conference. It's just like, well, excuse me, um, uh, well, if, if 
God deals with nations today. Does God deal with nations today the way he dealt with nations back then? Because if he does, should we be kind of like calling a fast and trying to repent because it seems like things are going really badly in our nation? And I did not get an answer. <laughs> like, um, what, I, what I did get, though, was an ongoing question, which I've been thinking about for many years. And I, I'm completely convinced from the Bible, God deals with nations still. There is such a thing as individual responsibility, but there is such a thing as the characteristics and the sins of a nation. And when nations reject God, yeah, God like this, you know, you would say even from this, God gives us warning. We don't get a letter, a prophecy to Britain today, do we? But we can read God's word and say, oh boy, the sins of our nation are serious. And we should take this seriously. We should be concerned for the future of our nation because God may well say, like he said to the Philistines, enough, the sword. You can, you can have your conflict with Russia and China if you want to. And we'll see how that works out for you, shall we, Britain? <laughs> we, we should be careful. We should be warned. and should, we, should be, we should be people who are seeking God. Look, can I just say to you, I, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet, but if I understand the way God deals with nations from his word, then I would say we're in big trouble. And it wouldn't surprise me if the Lord brings catastrophe to our nation. It wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me at all because we've known so much and rejected so much. We've sinned and embraced sin so enthusiastically we are now calling evil good and good evil in our country. And, and it wouldn't surprise me if the Lord brings catastrophe, disaster, even war, to chastise us as a nation, to, to punish us. That wouldn't surprise me. But look, God warned the Philistines. Think of that. <laughs> he warned the Philistines. I would say take the warning whilst you can. Be, be warned. Beware. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Because remember, he knows how to punish and protect at the same time. All right, Psalm 23 and Psalm 24. Two wonderful <coughs> psalms. This is great. Psalm 23 in Hebrews, just 57 words. That's not much, is it? Actually, in Hebrew as well, there are 28 personal pronouns attached to those words. Mm -hmm. What's a personal pronoun? It's the word I or me or my. Um, so it's all, this is a very personal psalm. It's all about the good. So Psalm 22 is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. Psalm 23 you would say, is the chief shepherd uh, who takes care of his sheep. Psalm 24 is considered to be the great shepherd. <laughs> I'm not sure what the difference is between the chief shepherd and the great shepherd, but it's kind of cool to think that they're both about the great shepherd, the, big, the, the, the real shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Those would be the best. He leads me beside still waters. The shepherds would sometimes make a little dam and make a pool of water which would be still because the sheep could get into trouble in the streams. So they'd find a little creek and they'd put a dam and they'd get some still waters for the, for the lambs. He restores my soul. Don't you need 
your soul restored regularly. I do. I'm so glad I have a shepherd who does it. <laughs> he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Oh, this is good. Sheep like paths, don't they? Have you seen that when we were walking in the whale, in the whale's hills, the Welsh hills? <laughs> when we were walking there, there's these little... When we went up on top of... Um, when we went up to the, the source of the River Severn, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And we got up on top and it's all like heather everywhere. And then amongst all the heather, you find a little sheep trail. You know, oh, I can walk here. Because the, the sheep, they wander about all over the place. But if they find a path, they walk on it. And then it becomes a, a, a proper trail. The, the ground is trodden down. The plants don't grow, grow so much. And it gets easier to walk on that. But there are different types of path, aren't, aren't there? There are paths which are paths of wickedness. Psalm 1. We talked about that, didn't it? Um, what does it say? Blessed is the man who does not, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Mm. There is a way of sinners. And there's so there are paths which are, are wicked. And there are other paths which are paths of righteousness. The thing about a path is once you're on it, it's easier to stay on it than it is to wander off, isn't it? And so it's on, on, if you're on the path, a path of wickedness, uh, a path that leads from wickedness to wickedness, it's a dangerous place to be, isn't it? You need to get off that path. If you're in, in the paths of righteousness, that's, they're just going to lead to more righteousness. It's wonderful. What a thought that the shepherd is wanting to lead you. You're going through life and you're like, which way should I go? And the shepherd wants to lead you down this path, which is a path of righteousness. And you want to follow the shepherd. Now, why is he doing it? For his name's sake. It's so good, isn't it? That he's leading us into righteousness for his own sake. Verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So David has a brother, Mike, Mike Dion, when he preached on this psalm, he said, David's in the wrong place with the right person. <laughs> okay, you know, none of us want to be in the valley of the shadow of death, do we? I mean, that's not a great place to be. But if you are in the valley of the shadow of death and you're with the right person, it's okay. <laughs> when you go through times, Karis, that are frightening, you can repeat this to yourself. I've done this many times. I've done it literally walking down a road that was so dark and so frightening. And there, there were people there who used to, in my village, they used to do what we called cockfighting for the Americans. That's rooster fighting. Um, and that was illegal. And they used to meet in a little place. And the path that I took to my friend's house took me past where they used to hang out. But there was a waterfall and you could see... I knew that it was dark and they could probably see me coming if they were there. And if you went there when they were having their games, you were in big trouble. You, you could get a beating just for being there. And, and so, at least so I was told. I never actually saw any of them there, but that's mm -hmm. what I was told. And so I would walk down there and I couldn't hear and I couldn't see. I didn't know if there was someone waiting in the hedge 
who could see me and would jump out and give me a beating. That's what I thought. What did I say when I became a Christian? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And I'd say to myself, God can take care of them. And then I'd walk through. I'd get to the other side and I'd go, oh, I'll carry on. <laughs> but it's true, you can do that. You can do that when you're in all sorts of different dangers. You just need to have it. To have this in your head and remind yourself that God is with you. Verse 5 is even better. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What's he saying? He's saying, well, look, God is able to take care of me even when my enemies are right there. God is showing me, anoint, you anoint my head with oil, that would be very special hospitality. My cup overflows. God's pouring, by the way, that's biblical. God's pouring <laughs> water into your cup to the point. He's, he's saying, here, have some have something to drink. And it's like, oh, it's not as stingy. It's not half empty or half full. It's full and overflowing. And goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David's saying, it's going to be all right. Why? Because I have a shepherd. Now, are you saved? Are you saved? Did, did Jesus go to the cross to die for you? Well, then Jesus is your shepherd. Mm. The son of David is the great shepherd. David was the shepherd, the son of David. And David wrote this. He was talking about his... Say again? David was talking about his greater son. His, his greater son, son. yeah. You see, he, he's looking to God, who's his shepherd, who's... He's capable of doing for him what he used to do for the sheep. Only better. All right, Psalm 24. Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There's an old-fashioned yeah. word. Oh, and everything in it. Say again? I used to say, and everything in and it. And everything in it, yeah. yeah the world and all those who dwell therein. For he, it must have been someone with old-fashioned language who translated this psalm. Mm -hmm. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. What's it saying? God made the world. Mm -hmm. And interesting, um, it's all his. It's all his. Isn't God amazing? Now, Here's then the problem. Who, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? So yeah, God made everything. God is amazing. God is actually more than just amazing. God is holy. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord and stand in his holy place? All right, here's the answer. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. All right, hold that for a second. Is that you? Do you have clean hands and a pure heart? Have you lifted up your soul to what is false and sworn deceitfully? Oh, that's a problem, isn't it? Because all of us, to one degree or another, uh, fall short of this, don't we? We don't have clean hands and a pure heart. We, we've, we've sinned and fallen short of this. Uh, thankfully, there was one who didn't fall short. And that's the great shepherd. He 
did have clean hands and a pure heart. He didn't ever lift up his soul towards what is false. He didn't ever swear deceitfully. And he was able to ascend the hill of the Lord. He was able to go up to God. He was able to go near to God. And we can be made clean and made pure through him. And we can be made to be acceptable through him. Now verse 6, that purity um, is what we need, isn't it? Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. The, I think the New English translation is really helpful, uh, it, the way it transliterates this, not transliterates it, sorry, that's the wrong, the way it um, summarizes this. Such purity characterizes the people who seek his favor. Uh, it's a paraphrase, isn't it? Sorry, such purity, S such meaning all that's just been spoken about, having clean hands and a pure heart, not lifting up your soul to what is false, such purity characterizes the people who seek his favor. So are you going to be someone who seeks God's favor? Yeah, well, God is going to save you and wash you clean so that in his eyes you're clean. But then also he's going to work on you, isn't he? He's going to sanctify you. So just like in Psalm 15, um, we're saying it's, you know, who may, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right, who speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue, who takes, does no evil to his neighbor, takes nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, does not put out his money at interest, does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be moved. Yeah, right. It's God who's going to come and change you so that you swear to your own hurt, and then you go like, oh no, why have I said that? Okay, I'm not going to change. You, you're you're going to not take up evil against your neighbor. You're not going to slander with your tongue. You're going to walk do blamelessly. Now, that's never going to be perfectly. But you can still, in this life, as a someone who is seeking the face of the God of Jacob, you seek the face of the Lord, and you sin... But you can sacrifice, you can go and ask for Jesus' blood to wash you clean, you can have your feet washed, and you can be clean in God's sight. You can be blameless before him. So, did you do that today? Did you do it yesterday? <laughs> Are you walking blamelessly before the Lord? Are you keeping short accounts with God? Now verse 7 uh, through to 10 is... I think all about heaven welcoming Jesus. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. Selah. Mm -hmm. All right. There's this moment, isn't there, when Jesus comes into heaven triumphant, having paid the price for sin. He ascended into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And I think this was the kind of thing going on then. Lift up your gates that the king of glory may come in. <laughs> Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. Hang on a minute, that's yeah. Yahweh of hosts. Yeah. He is the king of glory, but it's the son. And they're all saying, oh, no, he is the king. And, and yeah, praise the Lord. Let's worship him, shall we? Yeah. Lord, we, we love you, we praise you. We praise you that you 
were able to ascend the hill of the Lord. Um, you could go because you were perfect. And you could go and then now live there to make intercession for people like us who are so far from perfect, sinful. Thank you, Lord, that you have washed us. Thank you that you do wash us day by day, cleansing us from all sin. We ask you to forgive us and to cleanse us and to allow us to walk in the Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're done for today. God bless you. We will see you tomorrow. I have a horrible thing, feeling that that was about 36 minutes. I'm sorry. Okay. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Bye-bye.